Welcome to Season 5 of the Agile Brand with Greg Kilstrom, where we talk with enterprise and technology platform leaders about the people, processes, and platforms that make marketing and customer experience successful, scalable, and sustainable. This is what creates an Agile brand. I'm your host, Greg Kilstrom, advisor and consultant for Fortune 1000 marketing and CX leaders and teams as principal and chief strategist at GK5A and best-selling author, keynote speaker, entrepreneur, and Agile certified coach. The Agile Brand Podcast is brought to you by Tech Systems, an industry leader in full-stack technology services, talent services, and real-world application. For more information, go to teksystems.com. To sign up for the Agile Brand newsletter and get the latest insights and articles on marketing technology and CX, or to purchase a copy of my latest book, House of the Customer, go to gregkillstrom.com. You can also find all my books on Amazon and other retailers. And now on to the show. Welcome to a special episode brought to you by Next Up Solutions, a premier agile training and coaching provider headquartered in Arlington, Virginia. They offer a broad range of in-person and virtual agile, scrum, and Kanban services led by experts with backgrounds from a wide assortment of industry sectors. Next Up alumni report improved work satisfaction and increased productivity. Today, we're going to talk about business agility and how it can be measured both internally with your employees and teams, as well as externally with customer experience and success metrics. To help me discuss this topic, I'd like to welcome Kurt Peterson, Certified Scrum Training and Agile Coach with Next Up Solutions. Kurt, welcome to the show. Thanks, Greg. It's great to be here. Yeah, thanks for joining to talk about this. Uh, Why don't we get started by you giving a little background on yourself as well as what you're currently doing? Sure. Um, I'll give you the the sort of the brief arc of my career. I actually started my career in software development or in commercial software development as an engineer. I worked at NASA for three years and then moved to IBM. Both of those were in Texas. And then I transitioned into project management uh, when I moved to Seattle. And I got exposed to a lot of interesting clients up there, Microsoft, Ernst & Young, uh, some other Paramount Entertainment, and ran a variety of projects and really learned how to use a Gantt chart really well. And then my last uh, sort of formal project I led was in Austin, Texas, uh, back in 2004. And at the end of that, I realized there was a better way of working. And I, like many other project leaders, project managers, started to look for this, this, uh, this other way of working that ended up being called Agile. So I found the Agile Manifesto. I signed it online. I brought Ken Schwaber to Austin to teach one of the early certified Scrum Master workshops and then tagged along with him for a couple months. And That sort of set me on this path of becoming an educator, a coach uh, of teams, and an advisor to organizations, just helping folks to understand and kind of wrap their heads around this different way of working and and have it impact their organizations and their clients. And let me tell you what I'm doing today. I am a lead trainer and agilist with Next Up Solutions. And um, what I do there is I I primarily teach Kanban workshops, uh, both private and public, I also backfill and kind of do Scrum as well. And uh, since I have a technical background, I focus in on some agile testing and automation as well. So that's sort of my uh, my current uh, hat. And it's a great group to be with. And uh, really, uh, it's been a joy to be there with uh, a, a really a fantastic group of people. Great, great. Well, wonderful. And so we're going to talk here today about business agility and why it's not just for IT teams. Certainly there's there's a lot of prevalence in in those those parts of the organization. But you know, while Agile had its start in IT and certainly in many organizations that's still where it starts, why are more organizations adopting it more broadly within the company and what are they hoping to achieve by by doing so? Yeah, you know, it's interesting, Greg. In the early years of the Agile movement, it was, uh, you know, Agile sort of as a way of working or a set of practices and values definitely came in through the information technology door. And, and a couple things happened. People began to sort of be bump up against these different ways of working. When you're a Scrum team and you're working in these sort of smaller two week cycles, you start to have a, a stronger product at the end of that two weeks. I say stronger, you can more, more complete, more robust. And it usually involves people from marketing, from legal. Uh, sometimes HR people have to support you in kind of moving in a little different pace and rhythm. And so there was sort of a rippling out from a lot of these teams and organizations that were using, you know, Scrum, Kanban, other agile methods. 
And so just organically, they got touched. So that was that was one aspect of it. Um, I think the other thing is it just sort of began to permeate our, our consciousness as a commercial industry, whether you were in manufacturing or real estate or software development, you begin to kind of perk up to this idea of working in highly interactive, highly collaborative teams, doing things in smaller steps, getting feedback from the market, from customers, and really learning as you go and reducing risk. So I think the, the way of working, this approach that, that gave us some agility, it really, it just, you know, became a enticing and compelling for a lot of people way outside of software. Yeah. Yeah. What are some of the biggest challenges and hurdles that leaders may face that want to uh, move uh, more towards a greater business agility? Yeah. And, and let me, let me actually also define business agility. There's a number of definitions for it. Yeah. My favorite example is three years ago when the pandemic hit. COVID hit us in, in really pretty hard in March of 2020. And at the time, I was working for a company that was doing a lot of in-person training. In fact, we exclusively did. I, I was traveling up and down the, the East Coast, sometimes to the West Coast, doing in-person trainings in you know hotels and conference centers and corporate you know training rooms, you know, usually a two-day training. And suddenly overnight, that was taken away. That option was no longer on the table. And what we had to do as a company was determine how do we pivot? What do we do next? And how do we pursue that? And so I, I like the Kanban University's definition of agility and they, business, business agility. And they, and they say that business agility is the ability of an organization to match the pace demanded by its market. Yeah. So it, we were in a market where training was, you know, very important to their, you know, getting people upskilled and, and um, ready for the work they're doing. And suddenly our market's saying no, no more in-person training. All that's been canceled. We want to pivot to virtual trainings. Yeah. How do we run that? How do we validate that we have, you know, the right set of tools in place? And so, so that ability to kind of pivot and change quickly is what business agility is, is really all about. Yeah. And to do it together as a as sort of a cross-discipline organization or business unit, you could say. Yeah, yeah. And so what what are some of the hurdles then that that may get in the way? You know, but intention, best of intentions aside, um, you know, what are what are some of the things that may get in the way of implementing that that business agility? Yeah. So there's a couple at, at the kind of ground level, I'd say, sort of uh, you know, on the front lines. I was a software engineer for six years. And I don't think I ever saw a customer empathy map. I didn't know anything about customer journeys. I didn't even think I spoke with like an end user. And so this sort of siloed way of working where I'm in my cube, I'm doing my work based on what's been handed to me in terms of tasks or requirements or, you know, jobs. Um, suddenly, if I want to be more agile, I have to collaborate. I have to communicate differently. I have to, you know, be willing to exists with some ambiguity. And so as, as a leader of an organization, I, I think there's a challenge in just helping the workforce to embrace this different, more collaborative, more communicative way of working. It's for, for some people, it's very natural and, and it, they move right into it like a fish into water. Others, it's harder. So that was, that's, that's one thing I would say is very challenge is potentially challenging. The other one is our organizations are often optimized for efficiency. And what that means to me is that we've, we've arranged uh, departments and specialist areas to get really good at things like database management, or HR is really fantastic at getting candidates identified, placed, and you know trained in a certain realm. And so we have um, these, these silos, these visually speaking, these vertical you know lines in our organizations would really inform how we work. And, and often crossing those, those unseen boundaries, those, those invisible boundaries, can be hard because you know managers and directors are rewarded often on having a, a certain headcount and performing and having the department perform optimally, and that can go against having a cross-discipline team, which is actually pulling people from many different disciplines and departments working together to deliver value. It, that can be a, a, a big transition to identify and assemble the right team and just acknowledge that you know we may have to go through some restructuring of our organization. Or yeah. at the very least, you know, disrupt some of the ways that we're comfortable with in terms of how we're, we're structured and arranged. Yeah. 
So then on the, on the flip side of that, you know, what are, what are some of the positive changes that you've seen once, once some of those, uh, those hurdles have been overcome and, and some of those changes have been made? One of my earliest, you know, agile projects or agile engagements was, I was in Capital One and in, in one of the very, very early stages of um, what, they, what they termed the lean agile. And, and lean agile was sort of paying attention to the collaboration, the scrum, but also value delivery across multiple teams and, and multiple units of the organization. And what really came forward in that setting was, you know, instead of lead times of, you know, four or five, six months, those were reduced by, and I'd say 30 to 40% and, and products were getting shipped much more quickly, you know, in the neighborhood of, of three, four, five months. And, and so just speed to market was one aspect of, of something you could expect as an investment in, you know, an agile way of working and also. I see increases in innovation. You know, when you take people from different disciplines, it's almost like you assemble a jazz band and you have someone with a trumpet playing next to someone that, you know, has a trombone or a violin or drums. And you start to bring these people together and you set up a space where they can experiment a little bit, maybe fail on occasion and learn as they go. And what starts to happen is these workers' innate creativity and talents begin to come forward. And suddenly these ideas that were, were dormant for, for many months or years start to come forward and, and you start to create a new, a new score for your organization. Some new music comes out. So I'd say innovation and, and speed to market are probably the two biggest benefits of embracing some of these agile methods. Before we continue, let's take a quick break. If you're like many marketing leaders today, you're inundated with a need to improve the customer experience across an increasing number of channels and touch points, all while ensuring your team is performing well, innovating, and continuously improving. So how do you find the time to determine what's next for you, your team, your brand, and your customers? My company, GK5A, can help. Whether it is advisory services, evaluation of marketing technology platforms and solutions, or digital agencies and implementation partners, or assistance with creating strategic roadmaps and prioritization of efforts. We've done it all and served as an ally to Fortune 1000 brands and in industries like financial services, healthcare, consumer electronics, professional services, and more. You can learn more about these services and contact us at www.gk5a. That's www.gk5a.com. Now let's get back to the show. You know, as as far as how this happens within an organization, you know, m more often than not, this is going to start with leadership making a decision that they want to invest in in more business agility, and and you know, some perhaps some of the details are going to be left to to others. But you know, it does take knowledge and it takes a commitment from leadership to to do it well. How would you suggest that you know those those business leaders? There's plenty listening to this show. How do you recommend that they learn more about agile and business agility so they can understand where to best apply it within their organizations? Yeah, I, I like that question a lot, Greg. There's there's so many resources out there around, you know, bringing agile into your organization. Uh, I, my, my first, not not to kind of pitch my pitch next up too too strongly, but there's a lot of great uh, leadership classes and uh, webinar resources available on the website of Next Up. So I certainly feel like we have uh, built a body of, of knowledge and, and support that leaders can turn to, you know, with, within, our, within our website. I do also think that there's, um, you know, learning from peers, you know, reaching out to peers that are on this journey or they may be a little bit ahead of the journey can be powerful. There's a, there's a gentleman, John Toussaint, uh, who's, who's from Appleton, Wisconsin, and he, he founded a, a group called... Um, I want to say theta care. So he's been really instrumental in lean agile transformations in the healthcare industry. And he wrote a book called Management on the Mend back in 2015. At the time, I was working with Mission Health, a large you know healthcare organization in Western North Carolina. And he really laid out some of the key tenets of what it takes to really launch and, and get, gain traction with a lean agile initiative. And and he he calls he has this thing called a model cell C E L L and and identifying that pilot project where there's enough business reason there's enough business drivers there's enough attention 
on that particular project to 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 draw people in, and then that becomes you know sort of a a bit of a fishbowl on how you can apply some of these agile concepts, and you start to you know build an understanding, generate metrics, invite people into that. So I kind of look to him as one of the people that's done you know dozens, if not hundreds, of these you know lean agile transformations as a as a great source of just wisdom. And I think his I think his website is createvalue.org. So he he's one I would point to. So those those are my two yeah. sort of off the cuff um, thoughts around getting leaders tuned into what it takes and and where they can find help. That's great. Yeah. And so, you know, along the lines of of creating value, the uh, next topic I really wanted to talk about with you was you know, there's there's a lot of change that accompanies adopting agile and as as you had mentioned, although there's a lot of potential for improvements and and benefits, but how do you measure uh, that and measure the effectiveness. So, you know, what, how, how would you recommend that leaders look at, at that question is just, you know, how is success measured in terms of adopting agile within an organization? Yeah. And, and I want to, I want to acknowledge the complexity of that question or maybe yeah, of course. It, it's, it's a great question. Uh, success can, it can be like facets of a diamond, you know, it can look so different to different people. If I, if I'm a um, marketing director, um, maybe success for me is is reach or or uh, you know a, a brand awareness, for example. So so certainly you know how can agile help us build success in those areas? If I'm a development manager, I'm probably more interested in team productivity, team retention, team satisfaction. So so I kind of like to think about metrics in sort of two realms. One is sort of internally, are we are we resilient as an organization? Are we communicating, collaborating? collaborating with each other. Are we productive? Are we efficient? There's a whole handful of metrics in both Scrum and Kanban that really look at sort of internal performance. You could say team performance. The The counterpoint to that is market performance. And market performance in some ways is, you know, a cleaner, probably more appropriate measure for gauging the return on our investment in Agile. Because at the end of the day, with business agility, you want it to move the needle in something that matters to your business leaders. You know, we want to increase subscribers in Latin America. We want to grow our market share in Germany. We want to reduce support costs. Uh, maybe that's more of an internal one, but maybe we'll, we want more responsive customer support. Or we want to improve the checkout pipeline experience for, you know, people that are maybe in, a, in an internet, in an area where there's slower internet uh, connectivity. Yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. So, um, you know, my next thing I wanted to talk about was the continuous improvement aspect as well. So, you know, it's one thing to get good metrics and everybody's excited and we're doing something new and, and it lasts for, you know, three, six, maybe 12 months. But sustainability of those efforts and really making sure that it's continuously improving because, you know, one of the agile principles is certainly uh, at least a few of them are related to continuous improvement and and things like that. So, how can you? And I guess there's there's a number of different aspects of why things are sustainable or or not. But I th I think one of those would be there are vocal advocates for agile within the organization that are there. What happens when they leave? So you know what my question I guess is how can you move beyond this? Okay, well, there's these three people and they're, they're all certified and they're all um, very excited about Agile. They move on. How does the organization really keep on that path of continuously improving and using Agile to, to its, its best effect? I love that question, Greg. It's a multi-layered question. It's a multi-level question. I'm certainly being aware of and attentive to individuals and their, their needs and their progression of career that's important to them is, is pretty vital. Getting them the appropriate level of, of training and support, having a nurturing you know, manager that's, that's helping them grow and thrive, I think that is key regardless of whether you're using you know, Agile methods or not. Um, I think that the, the, the big advantage of, of kind of an Agile way of working is letting the team begin to teach itself and to, to fulfill its performance or pro fulfill its potential as a team by just by letting them self manage. And that's a scary word for a lot of people. I mean, as a project manager for six, six, six seven years, really good with a Gantt chart. 
if you stick me in front of a group of people and tell me we're going to let them self-manage, I get really anxious. I've now, I've, I've gotten over that, but this idea of letting teams find their way, letting them take some risks together, I think there's nothing more powerful than people stepping into that role. And then ultimately they're going to be confronted with where they, they limit themselves. And it's going to go back to individuals deciding they want to, to do better, to bring more of themselves. So yeah. I guess, I guess I would say sustaining that improvement mindset is, is letting teams self-organize, allowing or, or leaders kind of, you know, supporting a, a culture of a no blame culture and a culture of psychological safety that would be, you know, really important. And yeah. then at the end of the day, individuals deciding that they wanted to do better and that, that doesn't always happen. One of the earliest companies I worked at, we kind of laid out what Scrum was asking and it asked for self-management, self-organization. And two team members said, that's really not for me. I'd rather be just told what to do. And I said, okay, go, go talk, take charge and see if there's another you know, place where you can situate. And they did. And it worked out great. Yeah. So yeah. Agile is not for everyone. And it asked for a, for a lot of uh, dedication and commitment to, to bring your best uh, every day. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great. So you, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but you know, I, I did want to talk, we talked a bit about internal measurements of success. I, I wanted to tie that then to the external metrics of success. And like I said, you, you touched on this a little bit, but I guess question for you, do you, do you find that tying internal and external successes together can achieve better results? Like, is that the, is that your recommended way of doing that? Or, you know, how, how do you, how do you look at that? Yeah, I think they're, I think they're totally related, Greg. I mean, if you told me I want, I want to, I want to run a marathon in two years and I want to place in the top 50% of that group, I'd be like, awesome. Let's start by walking down the street to the stop sign and then walking back. And, and let's, let's kind of build your internal capacity with oxygen. Let's build your muscle mass. Let's, let's get in the gym. Let's do some lifting. Let's get on, let's get cardio going maybe three, four, five times a week. So, so there's a, you're not going to achieve that outer goal without some internal investment. So I see there's definitely, you know, you take top athletes, there's a, there's a strong correlation between their dedication to doing things on their training appropriately and their performance on game day. And I think similarly, when you're out to pursue, you know, a new market opportunity, when you're trying to capture share in a brand new market, there's going to be a direct connection and tie back to how well your people are collaborating, swarming on work, how, how quickly they take something from a backlog and move it into a completed state. You know, is it two weeks, four weeks, six weeks? So I think there's a strong correlation between those, those two things. Great, great. So one, one last question before we wrap up here. So you've given a lot of great advice already as, as we've talked through different aspects of business agility. But what, what I'd like to ask is, what's one piece of advice that you would have for those business leaders out there that are considering moving their, their organizations into using greater business agility as they navigate the months ahead? Yeah. Um, I, I, and again, great question, Greg. Um, I guess my top advice would be don't try and do everything at once. And I, I know for some, in some settings that sort of is what you decide if you bring scrum in the door and there's some roles, events, and artifacts that you're really wanting to anchor into and practice, there might be sort of this overnight transition into a new way of working. In my experience, it, it can be healthier and sort of more appropriate for certain organizations to really look at some of the practices that are in the world of Agile, like, you know, getting things in front of customers earlier, doing what we call retrospectives every two weeks. Let's take a look at our process and talk about what one thing could we change to improve our outcomes in the next two week cycle. So, so I'd say be willing to take a gradual kind of stepwise approach to, to Agile. That'd be one sort of tactical that piece of advice I'd give. The other one is, is understand why you're doing this thing. Yeah. You know, yeah. some organizations, they reach for agile or they reach for scrum or Kanban because the neighbors are doing it because shareholders have demanded that we're agile. And that turns into, you know, agile, you know, bringing practices in without really having a compelling why. 
And to me, the why is what, you know, gets people engaged and motivated and, and really invested in the, in the world of agile. I mean, just you going back to the idea of you running a marathon, if you were committed to running a marathon in two, two years or even to, to, you know, six months, you would have that in your field of, of view as you woke up at five o'clock on a Tuesday, because even though you didn't want to, you knew that you had a, you had a bigger goal, a dream, a vision that was important to fulfill by doing these, by changing your daily habits. So I guess those would be my two things. Start, understand why you're doing it and then be willing to start where you are and take small steps. And, you know, I'm an, also an accredited Kanban trainer as well as a scrum trainer. And Kanban does have a uniquely, I'd say, different approach to change. And it, it says, don't change anything until you understand how you work today and start to visualize that. And so Kanban has practices that you can kind of bring in gradually and and apply those and then see results and then do it again so so i see a lot of marketing groups um, a lot of non-software development teams embracing conmod and having a lot of success with it yeah yeah great great advice i love love all of that well um, i'd like to thank kurt peterson certified scrum training and agile coach with next up solutions for joining the show this was a special episode brought to you by Next Up Solutions, a premier agile training and coaching provider headquartered in Arlington, Virginia. They offer a broad range of in-person and virtual agile, scrum, and Kanban services led by experts with backgrounds from a wide assortment of industry sectors. Next Up alumni Im- report improved work satisfaction and increased productivity. You can learn more about Kurt and Next Up Solutions by following the links in the, in the show notes. Thanks again for listening to the Agile Brand with Greg Kilstrom podcast, brought to you by Tech Systems. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to subscribe on your podcast channel of choice and leave us a rating so that others can find the show more easily. You can access more episodes of the show at www.gregkilstrom.com. That's G-R-E-G-K-I-H-L-S-T-R-O-M.com. To get a copy of my latest book, House of the Customer, visit my website or you can find it on Amazon or other retailers. The Agile brand is produced by Missing Link, a Latina-owned, strategy-driven, creatively-fueled production co-op. From ideation to creation, they craft human connections through intelligent, engaging, and informative content. Until next time, stay agile.